All right, everybody, welcome to Sunday. It's the start of the week. We're considering Sunday the start of the week. That's more in line with entrepreneurs. I don't know what number week this is. I'm into that. Everybody, oh. st you everybody starts working on Sunday, right? Like, I feel like yes. Friday, you recover. Saturday, you goof off. Sunday, you goof off till like three. And then you start working. Is that not? Does, Only that if you're a winner. Oh. Only if you're a winner. I'm like, that's just not what everyone does. <laughs> if you're a winner and you want to go Maybe far in your career. Saturday, if you accidentally wake up early, then you do a little email. Too. I mean, you could always, you know, pound out some emails if you get a little time. Kids are taking yeah. a nap or whatever your jam yeah. is. But Sunday nights are for uh, okay. winners to get ready for the week. Obviously, you know, it's okay. You don't, not everybody has to be a winner. But Sometimes today I you can, hear myself say things that I would never advise to anybody else, but that are the way that I prefer to live my life. So I, <laughs> it's very confusing. Like, I'm like, you shouldn't do that. I like it. <laughs> Molly, if you love your job and you work 60 hours a week because it gives you great joy, if you it's were best. then retired and you golfed 60 hours a week or skied 60 hours a week or did poetry or worked at a nonprofit for 60 hours a week, people would be like, oh my God, it's virtuous. Oh my God, it's inspirational. It, it's up to the individual how yeah, many hours point. they want to work a week and if they get joy from it. One person's um, hustle culture is another person's passion or vocation. So let's just leave it at that. You don't need That's to be a great way to put it. You're right. I'm not, I'm not trying to really be, I'm just, um, you're being judgmental with yourself. You are. Oh, I'm with myself. You out on it. you're being judgmental with yourself. God, I really you are am. saying, I feel bad telling people I work on the weekends because I'm so passionate about my job or on Sunday, I try to get ready to have a, That's to crush really the true. week. Yeah. You're doing something you love. It's okay. You can own that. And we'll own it today with a great VC Sunday school on the worst possible moments <sighs> for founders right before shutting down which is doing down rounds and the pain and suffering that down rounds include then molly's back with another this week in climate who do you got on this week in climate molly i do you know i'm obsessed with uh really boring topics that make a big difference such as energy efficiency i love yes. energy efficiency it is like a four to one investment for every dollar you invest in energy efficiency ah. you get like four dollars back and you have like four times the climate impact on just using less energy so I interviewed Dan Myers, who's the CEO of this company called Flare, which makes smart vents and wireless thermostats, not Wi-Fi. Like they don't compete with Nest. It. Nest yeah. is actually a customer. And then they build this advanced software for residential heating and cooling to literally just manage and make sure it's efficient and that your like filter has been cleaned and all of the things that save you tons of money, save a ton of energy, put energy mm -hmm. back into the grid. It's just like simple and beautiful. I've wanted these smart vents because you know, you, you you put in a nest. And maybe the zone is four rooms. Maybe right. two of those rooms are not used at night. They should be shut. There's no reason to heat my office at night or heat totally. the living room at night. We're all in our bedrooms. The only three rooms that should be heated are the bedrooms. And I love this idea of this like microclimates and, and micro climates. Really that's exactly it. what it is. Yep. And it's the vent can do that. Room. The vent can give you another level of control. By just closing a vent which i do manually like a maniac i'll just close, close the vent in the hallway when there's a guest in the guest room to make the air conditioner and just go in there or the heat goes in there so i can't wait to hear this flare yeah. coming up next it's going to be a great show stick with us this week in startups is brought to you by vanta compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business vanta makes it easier for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast twist listeners can get one thousand dollars off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. Smash Digital. Scaling organic traffic for your startup can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Visit smashdigital.com slash twist to get a free SEO video audit for your business. You'll see if SEO is right for you and what it takes to become an industry leader. And the Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub helps all founders build a better startup at a lower cost from day one. Open to anyone with an idea, you'll get up to $150,000 in Azure credits, technical advisory, access to mentors and experts, free dev tools, and so much more. There is no funding requirement and it only takes minutes to join. Sign up today at aka.ms slash this week in startups. All right, Molly, it is Sunday, so it's time for VC Sunday School. This is where you uh, ask me a question your first year of being a venture capitalist thanks to the fans who have started to make uh you know blog posts about the show i saw one fan had put together a whole architecture if you want to take the content from the show and make a landing page uh and, and get some promotion for yourself or maybe break into venture capital 
there would be no better way to do that than to write a blog post about every single episode or make a notion or coda instance about every single episode. And then when you try to get a job in venture, you say, Hey, look, I made this thing where I'm trying to learn from VC Sunday school from Molly and Jake Al. I bet you you get a job from it or an internship or, you know, your chances of getting the job go up. So make content based on our content. And so I'm giving you yes. permission right there. But what's your question? Definitely. Molly? Um, let's talk about down rounds. Oh, and I know, I know it's oh. such a freaking bummer. Um, you know, we could do a bonus on bed sizing if you want to, because that's what well, was so fun on Tuesday. Um, but there was this interesting, I'm now starting to like correlate stories I see in pitch book and data mm. I see in pitch book with things that I'm experiencing every day, which mm. is uh, companies either, you know, still wanting to believe in the last valuation or having to raise at a lower valuation or having yeah. to raise some sort of a bridge round. And then pitch book had this piece about how there are um, like all these companies that are have had unicorn status billion dollar valuations. Mm -hmm. And of them, like the top 10% of late stage startups by valuation have seen their those valuations plummet from $1.1 billion in Q2 to $680 million. Mm -hmm. So down 43%, a 54% decrease from pre money valuation. So what it made me wonder is, what is our role? Mm. What happens to us if one of those unicorns has that valuation decline? And what is our role in the kind of valuation cycle at the early stage? Like, can we be saying to founders now, if they're coming to us and they're like, I really want a $90 million valuation. And we're like, Ooh, it's going to probably, it's like a 40 right now. But is it also, are we able to say to them, like, look, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you could be set up for a down round later. Mm -hmm. So, okay. When Lot the company is struggling uh, and you get into a situation where your existing investors are unwilling, Molly, to do a bridge round. So you said to your existing investors, hey, I want to do a bridge. Can you give me, you know, another million dollars based on the last valuation? Now, this could be a 10 million or a billion dollar valuation. It could be a hundred thousand dollars. It could be a hundred million dollars, whatever the and number bridge is. Bridge is like, I need a little more money, but I don't want to do a new round just yet. I can't find a new lead. Yeah. So the height of venture funding is you have multiple new investors giving you a term sheet and you're picking between them. It's a competition and some might say an auction, but there's a competition to lead the next round. That means your company's doing great and the market is hot. That's what we experienced for the last five years. Just massive competition to lead rounds. And it became super intense in the last two years. Okay. Yep. And the next the stage idea. down is go ahead, Molly. That's the ideal. That's like, that's the best, ideal best possible. Yep. Okay. Best possible for the founder. Not great for the investors, because it means if there's competition, you're going to be paying a higher price. In some case, in cases, absurd prices, the deals are going to close quickly, there'll be less diligence. I, in fact, I would say it, it can get unhealthy. Yeah. Okay, now the market collapses, you can't even find somebody to lead your next round. So you do a bridge and you ask your existing investors, hey, we did a lot of work, we'd like to increase the valuation 30% because we increase the revenue 30%. And they say, Okay, fine, we'll give you a bridge. We want to own more of the company, we believe in the company. Next step down. Hey, we couldn't find a lead. You don't want to do a bridge and an up round, would you be fine doing a flat round? Okay, flat round. They say no, we're not interested in flat round. Say, okay, are you interested in investing at all as a previous investor? And they say, Yeah, but we want to get three warrants, we'll do the last round, but we want to get three additional shares for every share we buy now. So we'll give you the million bucks. That million bucks is going to buy 5% of the company, it's a $20 million valuation, but we want an extra three shares. So we're essentially going to be buying 20% of the company, but we're going to be putting cash in for five, we have the option to buy those other warrants. Okay, that kind of sucks, right? S you're getting a million dollars in cash in you're diluting 5%, but you have to give away 20% of the co company ultimately with these warrants. Mm -hmm. and we talked about them before. Mm -hmm. Then there comes the worst case scenario. This is when you have a cram down round, a pay to play round. And a, a new investor comes in and says, y'all don't want to put in a single dollar, the existing investors are giving a complete vote of no confidence. They're unwilling to put any money in founder goes to their attorney and says, I want to do a pay to play round. I am going to do a cram down round. Every single person who has preferred shares now is going to convert their preferred shares into a common share alongside the founders. So let's say there were 10 million shares in the company worth $10 each. That would be a $100 million valuation. 
those 10 million shares, and let's say 30% of them, 3 million were preferred shares, 7 million were common. We're going to make them all common. They're all common. Now we have 10 million common shares. And we are going to value the company at, let's say, 20 million bucks. <laughs> so <laughs> now instead of $10 a share, they're $2 a share for common. But we have a new investor coming in who's willing to put in 5 million bucks. And they get the preferred shares. Everybody else is common. Let's say it's even a $15 million valuation. So they own 33% of the company. The 30% you own is now in common shares. You lose your board seat. You lose your information rights. You're just like all the other common shareholders. And then the common shares affects the liquidation preference, right? You're junior to the preferred shares. Correct. You get paid later <laughs> if you get like... If you get anything. If, they, if you get anything. Yeah. And that overhang is now washed. So that, let's say you had paid... 10 million bucks or whatever for your 30% ownership over time. Um, you don't that 10 million doesn't count towards anything. You just own common in the company. Your common is now worth a third of the remaining 70%, let's say 50% if it went down to so you have like 15% of the common. So you went from 30% of the preferred to 15% of the common. And sometimes these cram down rounds are even more brutal. You know, they just say it's a $10 million valuation, new investors are getting 50%. Common is 5%. So you now you're at like 5%. So you still have like a chance that you may get a recovery, but it basically means you're washing everybody out. That's, that's like the last ditch effort for a company before they shut down. Listen, founders, very important. If you're in SaaS or you're in services and you store customer data in the cloud, you need to be SOC 2 compliant yesterday. And you don't, you might be hearing this and you may not even know what SOC 2 is, or maybe you heard about it. You know, you're behind the eight ball. Let's get this solved today. This week, I want you to be compliant from a third party so that you can close big deals. Do it now. Do not look like a, a dope when you try to close a deal and they're like, do you have SOC 2? And you're like, uh, that long pause, that's going to be the sound of them going to your competitor. Use Vanta, which makes it incredibly easy to get and renew your SOC 2. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks and compare that to three to five months without Vanta. And they partner with over two dozen audit firms who have been trained to file SOC 2 reports directly within Vanta. I was able to invest in Vanta. It's a great company. A bunch of my portfolio founders have used Vanta. They've had amazing experiences. They give it their highest rating. And, and let's just be clear here. If you're not SOC 2 compliant, you can't close major customers. It's that simple. It's one of the first things they're going to ask for. Here's the best part of this ad read. Vanta loves this week in startups. They want to support founders and they want to support founders early. And they don't want you to break the bank. So they're going to give you $1,000 off. Think about that. Get $1,000 off at vanta.com slash twist. V-A-N-T-A dot com slash T-W-I-S-T. $1,000 off vanta.com slash twist get your sock to now. And then if we're the investor in that situation, what does the calculation become? How do we make our decision? Yeah, how do we way? decide yeah. if we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll take that common stock, I guess, you know, as opposed so, to what are the alternatives for let's say us who has decided yeah. we've decided not to invest anymore? Yeah, we're about to be washed out in this way. Yeah, then what do we say internally? So we internally have a discussion. Okay, do we want to pay to play in this round? Do we want to put another 500k in now that they put a gun to our head? You know, it's not a flat round, you know, uh, we're going to lose all of our rights, we're losing our board seat, we lose our preferred, we lose our liquidation preference, we lose our interest on the note, all that stuff gets washed, we own common. Would we invest in this company? This is how you have to look at it. It's from like, right. just first principles. If this was a new company pitching us, forget about the money we've invested already, would we participate or not? And that's really the most intellectually honest way to do it. Very hard to do because you might have emotionally been involved with this company for five years, you might have been on the board, and it's just hard. And what you have to do, I think, as an investor, and this is what we would do in our investment team, and I literally had a conversation with somebody who had a down round, and they said, Hey, you chose not to invest from our fund. And I slacked them back. And I said, Okay, here's how we make our decision. The fund has a certain amount of reserves, the investment team looks at the opportunities before it. And we give that money to the highest growth companies. Your company has not been high growth. It's, it's you know, had some challenges. It's not a vote of no confidence. We are only giving those reserves to the top 10 or 20% of the people in the portfolio. So you're not in the top 10 or 20% doesn't mean that you're not in the top 70%, you know, or the 80th percentile, it's just you're not in the top 20. So don't don't take it as uh, a vote of no confidence, take it as a, a, a vote that we are only investing the remaining funds in those funds. 
the, what they call the reserves in a venture fund. You, you want the reserves to go to the highest performers so that you can ensure your LPs get the best return so that you can ra raise your next fund. And so it just you, you have to be cutthroat at that point. This is investing, not friendship. This is not your pal who's down on their luck. And they're like, hey, buddy, you know, we were best friends in college. I'm, out, I'm down on my luck. Can you send me 500 bucks so I can make my, make my rent or I could use, you know, five grand to help my kid pay for college. Like I get those phone calls, you know, and it's like, as I say, you're nicer than I am. That's always a no. Well, <laughs> it's either a no or a donation. I don't look at it as a right. loan. People ask me They're for a loan. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like, here's a gift right. one time. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I, if it truly feels like it's something I should do or whatever, or, you know, like sometimes you got to say no because you got to take care of your family, right? Yeah. Your own family. It's a, it's a hard thing to do or you don't want to enable people. And so this is what it's like for VCs. We are investing other people's money. We have to think, we have to think about our fiduciary responsibility to them before our friendship responsibility to you. That's the hard thing sometimes for founders and capital allocators. And I would be lying if I said it wasn't hard for me. Yeah. It's a hard part of the job. I'm in the meetings. It's awful. Um, and not, not all of them, but enough of them where it's like, it's clearly very painful. Um, but let me be ruthless and keep talking about the options related to down rounds, because sometimes they can also trigger anti-dilution preferences. Yeah. Is that right? And what does well, that mean? So you may have the some right set that says you get to approve an M&A transaction, you get to improve the issuance of new stock, you might have the ability to buy any shares that are being sold first, you have first right of refu refusal if some common shares get sold, or some preferred person wants to sell. So there's a series of preferred rights uh, that venture capitalists are putting money in fight for. And um, those sometimes are called protective provisions. You know, the anti dilution one is, hey, if you're going to dilute us, we need to approve that. Um, so, okay, yeah, Sequoia is coming in to do the Series B. They want to take the whole round. Okay, yeah, we'll waive our pro rata. We'll, we'll get, give them major investment rights. We'll waive our ability to block a sale. So typically, VCs have some say in future corporate governance transactions in these protective provisions, anti dilution being one of them. And, um, but if, if you're not willing to put money up, and the company has exhausted all options, they've looked at M&A, but and there's just some, you know, mani uh, you know, maniac, maniacal true believer who says, I believe in this business, but I believe in it as a $5 million business where I put in a million and I get, you know, 2x Warren coverage, I get a 10% a 15% interest rate, because none of y'all believe in it enough to put up a single dollar. Then the founder says, you know, listen, I exhausted everything. This is the hard reality. And it's legal to do this. It's legal to do this. It's it's a corporate governance issue. If nobody wants to back the company, yeah, yeah. the founder wants to keep going. I, I understand it as a founder. So, you know, it's hard medicine. It is what it is. Take the medicine. One of the first things I do before I invest in a company is I look them up and I check on their SEO. I want to see if they understand how to get that free traffic from search engines. You know, the, one of the most basic things you can do to drive free, consistent traffic and make it easy for your customers to find you is SEO. And a lot of people, they, it's it's a little scary for them, right? They think it's like a black art. They don't understand the basics of it. A lot of the basics of it is just very technical content and basic blocking and tackling. And so you got to call our friends over at Smash Digital. Smash is hyper-focused on SEO and they specialize in high-end link building. This is not a generic digital marketing agency. They only focus on world-class SEO. Founder Travis, also an investor, and he started Smash Digital to help grow the businesses that he runs and invests in. An in-house SEO expert, I would say, gonna cost you 75 to 100K a year. And you're gonna still need a budget to make great content, to try to get people to link back to you uh, for that content, to send signal to the search engines that you're worthy of traffic. Well, Smash starts as little as 3,500 a month. And for a limited time, Smash is offering free audits for Twist listeners at Smash digital.com slash twist. That's right. You're going to get a free personalized video audit of your startup's SEO for free. Smash will map out the exact steps you need to take to outrank your competitors. Again, they're going to do it for free to try to build that relationship with you and show you they're good at what they do. So go to smash digital.com slash twist smash digital.com slash twist. Do we ever encounter like the weighted average adjustment or the full ratchet adjustment? Is that all like, <laughs> I mean, you could dollar cost much average for... into this. You yeah. know, like people talk about like when that. they're jtrading.com, uh, this week startups.com slash jtrading or jtrading.com. For some reason, the domain name resolves for some browsers, but in Chrome, 
jtrading.com is not. If somebody can look at that for me, who is a tech person and explain why we can't get I've had a bunch of trouble with Chrome lately. Like, I don't know. Some weird. people type in jtrading.com, they go right to the site. With yeah. Brave, it works fine. Chrome, it doesn't. I don't know what's mm -hmm. going on. Anyway, you can dollar cost average into a bad trade if you still believe in the company, I guess. So you paid 15 bucks for Warner Brothers Discovery. It goes down to seven. You say, you know what? I'll buy it. Uh, and my average will be the average between seven and 15 or whatever, 12 bucks and change. You know, I think it's a fine thing to do. But with private companies, because of the power law we talk about, Molly, what down rounds and cram down rounds basically tell you is this is not going to be one of your power law companies. So why are you spending time on it is what VCs say behind closed doors. Right. I have a different approach, as you know, which is I want to be um, just absolutely supportive of every founder we can to an absurd degree, understanding that because of the power law, the chances of them being the one or two names in a fund that make the fund, I don't care about that. I care about actually our reputation and the feeling, the emotion the camaraderie actually between us and the founder, uh, just because that's the loyalty that is part of who I am. So I want our firm to feel loyal to the founders, especially in defeat, because the founder I have experienced will get up again. And I want them to think, you know what, when I got my ass kicked, J Cal and his team picked me up. They gave me some water, you know, like the, uh, the hype man, you know, next to the fighter, I want to be yeah. the hype man next to the fighter saying, Hey, listen, you know, it only takes one punch, get back in the ring, you can do it. You, you know, you lost the first five rounds of the six round fight. But there's a chance. So get in there and give it your best. And I'm proud of you for, you know, the pummeling you took here. And just making it to the end of the six rounds and not getting knocked out and having a chance to knock the person out. That says something about your character to me. And I let if you do lose the fight, we'll be with you on the next fight. And uh, we'll give you some cold water. And we'll put that massage thing on your neck, the ice pack. And we'll hang out with you after the fight and break it down uh, and be with you in defeat. I just want to be that guy. I want us to be that firm or that gal or that it's, they, them, whatever. It's getting pretty like, it's getting pretty rough out there. Companies are coming and saying they've got three or four months of runway and then they can't raise yep. because of that. And yep. Do the, just random question. Do the holidays play into that at all? Like do people... Like if you're a company, you'll have three months of runway left and like VCs are goofing, not us, obviously, but VCs are goofing off because it's holidays. Like, it, is it even I, worse timing to be in that situation? There's a whole thing about seasonality of VC business. Like August, we shut down. December, we shut down. There's some truth yeah. to that in every industry, Hollywood included. Uh, deals don't get done over the holidays. People want to relax. Great deals get done at any time. I mean, if it's a great deal, people will do it on Christmas Day. Uh, they'll do it on Hanukkah. Like. It yeah. does not matter. July 4th, like if there's a great deal to be done, people will be like, tell their kids to go in the pool on July 4th and they'll yeah. go inside and be like, I'll be yeah. back in three hours. <laughs> yeah. Y'all eat some hot dogs. I'm closing <laughs> this deal to get my Uber and Airbnb share. So let's be honest. If it's an if it's a power law company, yeah. Yeah, people are gonna people are gonna be engaged. It doesn't so matter. Full stop right. there. Um, but what I would say actually is more likely is I do think some founders reflect during the holidays or the down market and they say, you know what? I'm done. And the I'm done conversation, or, you know, this part of my journey, this chapter in my story is going to close is a hard one for people to have, I should have shut down Mahalo, according to all my the advice I've gotten. But I made inside I pivoted it to inside I had that domain name sitting around I contributed the domain name that I bought for 65 to the company. And now the company does millions of dollars, I've got an incredible team there. And I think I can build it into a billion dollar company. I'm never say die rule off is still on the board. From Sequoia, he doesn't need to be. I told them, please get off the board. I know this is a waste of your time. Everybody Aww. said, no, I'm going to be with you to the end. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we're off then. I'm going to do 45 minute board meetings and I'm going to take it seriously and I'm going to try to get this thing over the finish line. And you know what? I kind of figured it out. <laughs> you know, like it's a five year old business after Mahalo, but you know, this thing's been going on for 15 years, 14 or 15 years, and I never say die. So yeah. I learned something about that. It's my personality to never say die. And it's Sequoia's personality to never give up on the founder if the, unless the founder gives up. And that's something I took from Ruloff, who's been a great friend to me and a great mentor. So I, I'm, I'm never say die. I, that's a mistake in venture capital, according to most people. I think it's uh, an attribute of a great human and a great life. I think you will have a great life if you actually curate friendship and deep, meaningful relationships. That's my belief about life. I can't separate business and life. To me, life, business, same thing. And it's a, it's a fault. People criticize me for it. But I also feel like it's a superpower. Other VCs are going to do better than me in the short term 
because they'll cut, they'll just leave the boards of these companies and move on to the next companies and I'll stick with them till the end. You know, whatever. You got to do what you yeah. think is right for you as a, as a human being in the world. And for me, I'm ride or die. Ride or it. die. Better All or right. worse. Jump on a so. grande for you. <laughs> That's it. Ride or die. Can't laugh at yourself. I mean, it's as corny as I am or I seem pretty much the truth. I mean, pretty much the truth. I got a lot of emotion no about this. Yeah. Difference whatsoever. <laughs> Friends, yeah. I really want you to know this. There is no <laughs> difference whatsoever in any J Cal that I have met in any environment or consistent. scenario. It Equally is embarrassing. Consistent. Whatever. We could literally have this Honestly. meeting go into the investment team meeting and there would be absolutely no change. There would in be tone. no difference. Exactly. No. We should make, we should sorry, do a like, public investment great. team meeting. That would we be a cool do. thing to do. Well, a public really? investment team meeting. I don't think I would have to get the permission of the really founders. Like that. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know how they would feel about that. <laughs> just get them to like agree to it. The ones who are like, um, would only do the like, ones. Do, you, do that, we ever sign like, NDAs? Is that a thing? I've had a no, couple VCs of times don't sign like, NDAs. Well, you sign an NDA, and I'm like, uh, I don't. I didn't do never. that as a journalist. We never so sign NDAs. Great. Uh, but our whole reputation is on being discreet. And if a if a VC yeah. is not discreet, man, that blows up right in their face. So I can't even imagine a scenario. Kind of don't have like, to blah blah on. blah about a company's internals, but maybe that's the, the most important thing. Really, is between portfolio companies that pivot. And overlap. I don't know if we did a VC Sunday school on that. What happens when Com two of your portfolio companies portfolio, yeah. wind up in the same space? So like, you know, Uber uh, pivots and adds Uber Eats and you invested in DoorDash or you had Postmates in your portfolio and then Uber adds Uber Eats, you know, something like that. Those things happen all the time. Somebody is in a, a consumer business and then they see some SaaS business doing better, but with the same sort of customer base and the same product. And they're just like, well, screw this. I'm not going to go D to C anymore. B to C, I'm going to go B to B. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there with two companies, we had this happen with in the influencer space, we have six or seven influencer businesses, and they all kind of start drifting towards making SaaS products. And now you have three people in influencer marketing who are have SaaS offerings, and they each, you know, overlap 10 to 30%. And you did then have to create firewalls inside your company. And right. then have a little bit of a conversation with them. But and then people will pitch you sometimes Molly on a company. And you're like, we have an investment in that space. And in that case, you have to say to the person, we have an investment in the space, I'm happy to meet with you. But you should know, we're already investors in DoorDash. So you know, Postmates come to you and say, Okay, yeah, I don't know if it's different or not, if you're comfortable investing with us, but I'm on the board of DoorDash. And it's like, Oh, no, no, I don't want to pitch you. <laughs> we're, we're going to compete with them. So you just be right. upfront with that if the founder, in fact, didn't do their homework, founders do your homework, look at the portfolio, make sure there's nothing in the portfolio that is competitive, you can't pitch. You can't pitch Bill Gurley on Lyft if he's in Uber already. It should be obvious, but you know sometimes you will have people send their deck and a bunch of details to a Bill Gurley who's on the board of Uber, and this like dumb founder never thought to look at the portfolio page. I mean, it's a really dumb thing to do. And they sent yeah. a bunch of proprietary information to them, and then Bill Gurley's got to delete and say, "I deleted your email. I'm on the board of Door." Uh, you may not know this, but I'm famously on the board of Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, incredible. All right. Well, there you go, everybody. It's a right, everybody. sized VC Sunday school. Dan Myers is on This Week in Climate Startups today. He's the founder of a company called Flare, which is super interesting. They offer smart vents and thermostats because climate solutions come in all kinds of flavors and energy efficiency is a huge one. I mean, this can drive so much change and such a huge emissions reduction and people just don't even think about it. So these Smart vents and thermostats help people balance heating and cooling across their homes and potentially then, of course, cut energy use. In September, Flare announced a $7.6 million Series A raise led by active impact investments and lower carbon capital. He broke down kind of the story behind the company, talked about the smart vent technology, how it gets installed in people's homes, uh, talked about how Flare actually started as a D2C brand, but then eventually gained the trust of HVAC professionals, which is not easy to do. It's a super interesting conversation, a really great solution. Uh, and I hope you enjoy. Dan Myers is the founder of Flare Systems. Welcome to this week in Climate Startups. Thanks. Great to be here. So um, tell me what Flare does is smart vents and thermostats. And that's yeah. all I'm going to say, I'm going to let you explain the rest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are mostly residential focused uh, climate tech focused on heating and cooling systems. Um, we are a combination of hardware and software. 
Um, and if you're a homeowner, we solve a lot of the most longstanding problems you've had with heating and cooling uh, sort of comfort in your home. We also make it really convenient to connect equipment that oftentimes uh, isn't easily connected by, say, a Nest or a Honeywell or some of the conventional thermostats that are out there. So to put a finer point on that, we, uh, we build a smart vent system, which basically routes air to rooms with people in them instead of, you know, the whole home at once. Um, we also make a smart thermostat for the world's most ubiquitous yet least connected uh, HVAC equipment called the ductless heat pump or sometimes called the mini splits. Right. So you don't install or make heat pumps or mini splits. You make the vents and the controlling mechanism for that heating and cooling. So it sounds like it could, so it could work with like an electric heat pump, but it could work with a traditional natural gas heating system. Yep. If you've got okay. an AC in a furnace or if you've got a heat pump, we pretty much work with all of them. Pretty much anything you find in a residential setting and in some cases like commercial as well. And then what got you? So you raised in September just last month, it sounds like you announced a $7.6 million Series A raise um, led by Active Impact Investments and Lower Carbon Capital. What is it about this that is and that has not only been hard to solve in the past, but is a is a venture scale business? It's a great question. So I think a lot of things have been hard to solve in the past in this space. So distribution is always tricky in the HVAC world. Uh, we sort of took an approach. It's a bit unusual for the heating and cooling world, which is we actually went D to C to start. Um, and we've been scaling that for pretty much since we went to market. Um, and then in, in parallel, starting to scale through the traditional HVAC channel. Uh, but we also sell through utility programs. So we, I guess we didn't talk too much about that so far, but uh, in addition to these hardware products, that, which are connected, we also sell services back to utilities that allow them to manage peak problems, which I know you're in California, comes up pretty much every summer where they're worried about blackouts. We solve a solution to kind of avoid a lot of that. So between those, you know, we've got a lot of op uh, ways of getting in the home uh, and a lot of people interested in having us in the home. So I think there's a venture story behind that. The other thing that's happening right now is there's this huge attention focused on um, getting off of conventional heating systems, in particular, oil and gas. We are the leading um, hybridization solution for the dirtiest homes in the United States, uh, whereby we provide essentially an on-ramp to fully or I would say maybe 90% electric heating for homes that essentially are burning oil and gas all winter long, especially in the oil case, huge amounts of carbon. We provide almost piggybacking on air conditioning, ironically, a mechanism for hybridizing a home that's very cost effective and um, attractive to a homeowner. And that, that I think is really what the copy eye of lower carbon yeah. um, and, so and a variety of other down, investors. Break that down for me a little bit. I don't totally understand what hybridization means. Like, sure. uh, clearly, I, I understand how you make the heating and cooling way more efficient. And is that what you mean? Nope. Uh, so it's actually, okay. right. Help me so, understand. <laughs> yeah. So we actually, when we started, we were focused on sort of the convenience, the comfort, the efficiency purely, right? And it was about yeah. kind of optimizing an existing system. But a couple of years ago, we had an opportunity where people, you know, in the Northeast, for instance, have homes that don't have traditional ducting. Um, they have boilers and maybe radiators or sometimes they're on the baseboards, but something, some sort of hot water that's almost invariably heated by gas or oil. Right. And it's like it heats one room. Uh, or actually, it will maybe. generally heat most of the home. So you'll have a radiator system throughout the whole home. Oh, There's a boiler oh, right. and, and a you'll basement. have an, a radiator in each individual room, yes. but, not, but not the ducting that we think of that is the tubes that go through the wall and carry air. Uh, totally. It's it's okay, uh, cool. what they call wet heat, quote unquote, right? And you're, it's either... You're, you're educating us on the <laughs> basics of HVAC right now also. So. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, and, and so those systems, which have all been fossil fuels, they've been around forever. And especially in the Northeast are, are quite popular because air conditioning wasn't really needed for so long. Mm -hmm. um, those systems, it turns out, have gotten a lot of attention because they're so carbon intensive. Um, and simultaneously, what was happening was uh, they didn't have ducting. So the path to adding a heat pump uh, was a little bit tricky. Uh, you didn't just plop down in, uh, a traditional central heat pump and say, cool, we don't need the furnace anymore. You didn't really have any of that infrastructure. So 
a specific type of system called a mini split. You might be familiar with them. They're usually hung up on a wall a couple of feet wide, like a white box and operated by a handheld remote. Yeah, uh, that's a category that we're one of the we're basically the leader in thermostatic controls for those. Um, Got it. Okay. And and what we and do is we has, I get it now that has been seen as sort of this hybrid. like you don't have to redo the whole house. You can put these in the rooms where you need them, for example. Absolutely. And yeah. so so what was happening in the marketplace uh, to start was people said, well, I just want this for my primary bedroom or my den for air conditioning purposes. And somebody smart at, I think, Eversource was the utility where somebody was really thinking, said, well, if we could just get these to run for most of the year in heating, we could avoid a lot of the boiler usage. And they couldn't quite convince or, or get homeowners to do that in a sort of a manual fashion. But because we could integrate with the boiler system and the ductless heat pump or the mini split, we could actually automate and prefer certain systems at different times. And so we were this sort of technological intervention to a behavioral problem. Um, and that Amazing. is, so we turned a house into a Prius, right? And yeah. that was sort of the start, um, just kind of a cool novel solution. Yeah. Amazing. So where are you currently operating? We operate primarily in North America in the US and Canada. Um, okay. We do actually also have an interesting JV in China focused on the 500 million mini splits that are in operation there and largely not connected to the internet for anything interesting or useful. Um, and we have a few projects here and there. We, we got a World Bank grant for a project in Colombia. We have a, an ongoing pilot uh, in Barbados. So we've got a few things in different places, but our sort of core markets are the US and Canada. Okay, I'm here with Allison Rose from Microsoft for Startups. So Allison, what is the most valuable resource for founders in the early stage of their startups that Microsoft is offering? So let's face it, financing is one of the biggest, if not the biggest roadblocks that startups face today. Through Founders Hub, we're alleviating some of the financial stress of starting a company by providing tons of free resources for founders. So we provide founders of any stage with up to $150,000 in Azure credits, wow. which is huge because that yeah, can be used to do anything from building your prototyping to a lot of our founders are using that for conducting experimental development without eating into your runway. So it's there's so many things that you can do with those credits. But beyond that, we also provide founders with free access to crucial tools and software like GitHub Enterprise, as well as a suite of Microsoft software like Office, Teams, Power BI, and so much more. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, those things alone are like a line item or two in any startup's budget. And you could redeploy that with an extra sales executive, designer, developer, just by recapturing those credits. The Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub has no fundraising requirements. It's open to anybody. You don't have to go to some elite program to get those credits. It only takes five minutes to apply and startups can get up to six figures of benefits right away. Sign up for the Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub today at aka.ms slash this week in startups. aka.ms slash this week in startups. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. And then walk me through a little more about the business model. You said you started D2C, there's a utility play, w who pays you and when? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is the majority of our product gets into the market, not because people are like, I really want to electrify or I really want to save a few bucks on my energy bill. Most people buy our product because they like the features. So we actually have a lot of consumer pull where they say, I've always wanted to have my home office or my bedroom the right temperature. And in order to do that, I have to like freeze out or overheat some other space. And for a couple hundred bucks, I can basically go in and solve that. Um, and so for a lot of homeowners, that's just has its own appeal and they'll adopt it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we can piggyback on all the efficiency or a utility program, those kinds of things. Um, we do also, though, go into the market through the traditional HVAC channel. And in that case, it's also a hardware sell. And then basically on the back end, once we've got devices in the home, we will work with a variety of grid integrators and aggregators and essentially promote those solutions to our existing customer base, uh, whereby, you know, the either the utility or our partner uh, who's facing the wholesale electricity markets will will pay us for the ability to sort of regulate, especially during peak times on the grid. Right. So customers can opt in at installation and effectively say, yes, there are times when you can remotely control 
my heating yeah. and cooling. Yeah. Yeah. And some people do that because there's an incentive and some people are just like, oh, I, I love the idea of trying to match when I use my, my HVAC with lower carbon times on the grid and things like that. Mm-hmm. Or to save money. These, I mean, I always think, I feel like these are always my favorite climate solutions in a way because they're the sort of Trojan horse ones. Like you don't have to have a philosophy <laughs> about climate change. You just have to want your house to be more comfortable or save money. I think consumers always love comfort, convenience, those kinds of things. Efficiency is efficiency is more of a vitamin. Uh, comfort is, I think, more of a painkiller. So to the extent that we can offer both, but maybe really solve a pain point for somebody, that's a really great solution, I think, when you're going after a climate problem. Yeah. And then how do you work with, if at all, um, traditional HVAC installers? Like if I were having a heat pump installed, which I hope to be doing soon, <laughs> would they know about you? You know, what, what would be the integration there? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. So would they know about us is a really interesting one. Uh, it's somewhat regional <laughs> I'll right ask now. Them when yeah, I get my quotes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so it's interesting, right? So we started D2C knowing that we could just stand up a Shopify store and nobody could tell us no, right? Yeah. Uh, the HVAC channel is a little bit slower to adopt connected products and, and new technology. And rightfully so, they've got a lot on their plates. Um, but I think some of the most forward thinking contractors have sort of found us and really started to promote it. And then in other regions, uh, rebate programs and other types of things have really promoted us into the HVAC channel. And we've sort of used that to, you know, open the door and get in and start to really grow our relationships there. So it's a mixed bag. We're basically bootstrapping that channel. I mean, we've, we've bootstrapped it pretty far so far, but you know, we still have a pretty heavy concentration in the Northeast, um, a lot of that attributed to the hybridization solutions. Right. Um, Talk to me about the actual product. So you have the Flare Puck, which is the wireless thermostat that looks a little like one you may be familiar with. (laughs) That's a nice round white design. Um, And then the Smart Vent, which requires at least one puck. So tell me about the actual mechanics, the actual hardware, how complicated is it how much does it cost to make and then how what's it what's the installation process like sure um so the yeah it's funny so the smart vent originally was sort of the thing we were going after um we i had grown up in a home in south florida i was living in chicago after college and i had this experience where just clicked one day i was like the sort of temperature imbalance problem seems to be a consistent problem in the u.s housing stock right Uh, So I said, okay, well, if I had a damper and an actuator that could kind of adjust how much energy is being delivered to rooms, seems like an easy way to solve it, right? Um, You know, dangerous thinking, but but nonetheless, it seemed pretty logical. It's no more dangerous than all of us up on some stool in the middle of the night trying to like move that dusty little (laughs) lever to like make, you know, not so hot on this side of the room. Right, right. Yeah, still safer than that. So as you can imagine, the smart vent looks a lot like a traditional vent. Um, but behind it is, or is sort of incorporated into it is this, you know, fully wireless, um, battery system, motor, uh, actuator that can open and close and regulate the amount of airflow into a room. Um, and so that, that basically we make a variety of sizes and it just drops right in to replace an existing vent. You don't have to do any fancy wiring, anything like that, um, which we thought was really big because nobody has wiring going to all these different, you know, rooms right. in their home. So, right. you know, we've designed it for really like four years of battery life built in. So, you know, I think that that ends up sort of solving any kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it range anxiety, but time anxiety, maybe. Um, and then, um, you know, what we found early on before we really went to market, this is early testing, was we needed a separate sensor. And that's kind of where the puck came from was, it's too hard to tell the room temperature from the vent. So, we said, well, why don't we feature creep our way into something a little more involved? Um, and at the time, as we were bringing up the supply chain, we were living in China and saw just endless numbers of mini splits. Uh, and so kind of added a little bit of features, feature set to kind of go after that market. So the puck works with the smart vent in the context of central heating, but in the ductless mini split context where you don't have ducting, um, the puck is a standalone smart thermostat that can be pretty much command strip to the wall with no wiring, no screws, no anything. It's a really fast install. And 
from an install standpoint at the software level, you know, we just kind of walk you through it. So you don't have to be an expert in any of this stuff. Um, you, you basically just sign up, create an account, you know, you get it online, pretty traditional IoT type uh, bring up. And then you just tell us, okay, I'm in the living room and I've got a Mitsubishi model one, two, three, and boom, it's connected and smart. Wow. That's pretty awesome. How much does it cost? Uh, we retail our smart vents between 89 and 109, depending upon the size. Uh, and the, I'm just looking per at vent. them now, per vent. And then the puck um, retails for 119. We also do, for the hybridization, we sell an exclusive version of the puck, which sells for a little bit more, um, but it's only available through the HVAC channel. Um, so it's a sort of feature enabled, almost like the way Tesla does it, right? Where they just flip a, a software switch and add some some features. We do something similar and sell that exclusively to the HVAC channel. So, and then from a pricing standpoint, the other thing that's kind of cool is you don't necessarily have to buy a puck for every vent. Um, you know, obviously there are rooms with multiple vents. We certainly wouldn't need them for that. But also in the event that you have, say, an EcoB and a bunch of remote sensors, which is quite common, um, we can actually take all the data from the thermostat and the remote sensors and drive the vents with that. So it can be a very cost-effective deployment if you've already made some investments in your heating and cooling system. Hmm. Although 100 bucks a vent, I'm sort of trying to mentally count the number of vents in my house. Like how many vents do people typically buy? Yeah, not- it... It's, it's a little not bit crazy, but it's not super cheap. Uh, it depends on what your reference is, right? Um, yeah. But I would say it actually is all over the place. We see kind of a bimodal buying pa- uh, pattern. So we see customers who the first room off of their air handler put a vent because that room just always gets too much heating or too much cooling. And they might get away with just one vent, right? And that Got just it. solves yeah. kind of a frustrating problem. And then we have other customers who are like, I want a set point on every single room individually uh, and, you know, across my whole McMansion. And, you know, they might put in 20. And (laughs) And they're your favorite. (laughs) They're they're, they're great customers, but we love all of our customers. But but yeah, it really varies. Um, I would say the typical customer, probably three or four, maybe up to five. And then after that kind of splits and goes into like the whole home side. Yeah, totally. Um, And then how are your margins on the hardware generally would i would say we generally run somewhere 60 plus percent um gross margin um but the you know i think the the other side of that would be obviously we've dealt with supply chain craziness like everyone else so uh you know try our best to keep them around there um but at the same time you know i think every any given month or any given buy there's always some fluctuation but pretty close to that And then how does the utility services part fit into the business model? Sort of the cherry on top. Uh, So, you know, it's, I guess I'm excluding that from a gross margins uh, calculation, but, but I mean, you can imagine we may make a few dollars per device a month um, in a program like that. Um, Some cases you're structuring contracts specifically where um, it's, it's almost structured as like a, a set amount per month. In other cases, some of the programs we operate in are performance based. So, um, if the cost of the wholesale markets, you know, go sky high, uh, and we alleviate a lot of the peak load, um, we could have a really windfall moment, actually. So, yeah. um, it's a little bit variable. I feel like I could imagine that. that becoming an even bigger part of the business as time goes on because it is such a, it's, in, it's more an, of an acute issue. Every year, it seems. Well, I mean, I think so. We work on the energy. I like to say sometimes, like, we work on the energy transition within the home and then outside of the home. And to that point, as you load into the grid more solar, more wind, some of these more intermittent supplies, and you throw tons of EV load and HVAC electrification into the mix, the estimates from RMI are a 3x increase in demand, right? So when you sort of combine all that new demand, and this sort of intermittency of the supply, the criticality of making sure those match up well is there's a lot of value there, right? And that's kind of some of the value we're, we're bringing to the market. And how do you think about your impact from a climate perspective? Um, yeah, like, I mean... That, and how big a part of your pitch is that? You know, we sort of talked about how this can be like a Trojan horse solution. Mm-hmm. But I mean, we all know that HVAC is like a massive, massive contributor. So I think the pitch to the homeowner 
we don't actually push it too much. Um, not because we don't love it, but more because, you know, the thing that a homeowner wants is just, hey, I want to control my unit from my phone or, you know, I want to solve a, a, an annoying comfort problem. So I sleep better or something like that. Right. So we try to meet them where they're at. From an investor standpoint or, you know, like more strategic conversations, like, yeah, obviously we love the story there. And, and how much do we think about it? I wake up every day excited to electrify homes. I mean, how yeah. could you not be excited about that? So it's definitely something that internally we talk a lot about in, in terms of building into the product we're focused on all the time. But when it comes to a homeowner, um, we obviously talk about what converts uh, and what converts is the other sets of the features. And we're just sneaking in all these benefits uh, without them even necessarily buying for any of them. Yeah, totally. All right. So where can people find you? If we're, they're shopping. We're, yeah, yeah. This. <laughs> we're primarily um, sold online. Um, the exception being the HVAC channel. So if you found yourself weirdly in a Johnstone supply or a Ferguson you know, plumbing store, you might find our products. But if you're a regular consumer, you'd find us on Flare.co, which is our, our sort of Shopify store. You'd find us on Amazon. You'd find us on Lowe's.com, Home Depot.com. Uh, so, and I would say, you know, we, we kind of love the online channel. I feel like it's actually a great way to, to be able to stay in touch with your customers, um, sort of pre-purchase and sometimes post-purchase. Yeah. And then who is your competition? I mean, I could imagine Nest is the obvious one, at least from the thermostat perspective, but is any, I've never heard of a smart vent until today. Okay. Granted, when we booked you, I heard about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> sure. Until I heard about Flare. I didn't know that smart vents were or could be a thing. Like, is anybody else doing this? So, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the first one I'd say is we actually aren't a competitor to Nest. We are a partner. Uh, so we don't make a traditional thermostat for central heating and cooling systems. Right. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, the puck. So the puck never has to be wired in, to be clear. Exactly. Yep. There's there's no ports to even wire it in. So it's it's specifically for the ductless heat pump market or as a companion to the smart vent. Um, and, gotcha. and okay. the ductless market, we're pre- sort of pretending to be the remote. It's kind of a cool, a cool hack in some ways, right? Um, and that's how we're universal and, e- and easy install. Um, but to answer your original question, um, so we, d- we have some competitors in the ductless control space, and rightfully so. There's like a billion and a half mini splits on the planet. Uh, and there's probably 30 OEMs that make mini splits. So there's a fantastic market, actually, I would say, actually, for the control side of that. Um, and on the smart vent side, uh, we had two competitors. Actually, they made a bit of a splash early on, but I think it caused us to do some really, uh, like, sort of well disciplined learning early on. So we had a competitor at the time called Keen, was on Shark Tank, actually, uh, raised oh. a ton of money early on. We had a competitor called EcoVent uh, out of MIT, and it raised a good chunk as well. Um, what ended up happening is they raised all this money. They ran to market with a product that wasn't quite ready for the big time. And I think from our standpoint, we were like this sort of, well, and also ran in the beginning. Um, and we just said, okay, well then we'll just do the scrappy bootstrappy way and and figure it out. And so we spent, you know, a lot of time lean and mean. And I think that forced us to focus on the product and the customer more so than uh, you know, some of the companies that were funded right out of the gate. And, and that I think just forced a successful product. At this point, we are the smart vent market. Um, but it took a while to be the smart vent market. <laughs> right. <laughs> but still, congratulations, slow and steady wins the race. And yeah. then finally, h- how did you get into this? What's your background that led you into this business? So my undergraduate, I did computer engineering, um, my master's at comp sci, um, the but i've always been really hands-on kind of mechanical just just love tinkering and building things and uh it's funny actually the way it got started was i was living in wicker park in chicago and um had this problem in my own place uh realized that this was a common problem called up my co-founder kenny and said hey i think there's an opportunity he was working at microsoft um and the thing that really got me going, though, was they had these free 3D printers to use at the Chicago Public Library, and I had never 3D printed anything. So I, I saw a poster or a flyer or something. And so after work, I was just writing software for a startup. After work, I went down there and I sort of got my bearings, catted something up, you know, the next day, 
brought it, printed, and just started going from there, right? It was just, I'm going to solve my own problem. And eventually I realized, oh, there's maybe a big market for this, for solving this problem. And then, um, you know, wa- eventually walk the plank. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Shout out the public library. That is such a great part of that story. I, uh, I would, I, at some point, I think I met the person who wrote the grants to get those 3D printers like years later. Uh, so just wow. amazing, right? What, what, uh, what a public library can do for you in the, in the modern era. That is absolutely beautiful. That's the perfect place to end this heartwarming tale. Dan Myers of Flair at flair.co, founder of Flair Systems. I cannot wait to buy this. <laughs> thanks for coming on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for watching, everybody. Molly, we got through the show. Please, no self-loathing. Don't be so critical of yourself. Work hard. It's okay. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. Thanks, therapist. You're so it's freaking fine. right. I it's fine love to work hard. My job. We have a short holiday week coming up. We do want yeah. to warn you. It, we do take some holidays, although we will probably work mm-hmm. on some of them because we can, because right. we like to. We will have shows on Monday and Tuesday, mm. and then the twist team is off until Sunday. I like this. Uh, I like this. It, I we like take this. a nice long break. Good. We could have done a Wednesday show. We used to do a Friday show. I'm just trying to be nah, a on. good boss and just let everybody take a nice breather. Uh, we, you know, but maybe you never know. Maybe I'll do like an emergency pod and I'll just throw on the, uh, <laughs> if Sam Bagman Freed gets picked up just on say. the tarmac on Thanksgiving, we're, I'm doing a live stream. We're so I'm just going put it out there. I'm going live <laughs> on my own. <laughs> but we're we'll be going off. live. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, president Mike Savino wants to know if we're doing our one-on-one. So I guess we better wrap. Stay tuned though, for a potential bonus episode, speaking of which that we may or may not drop mm. over the weekend, but either way. Yeah. We'll see. You We're tomorrow. also ramping up our social game. So check out uh, our TikTok. Search for This Week in Startups, our Instagram, This Week in Startups. We're, we're putting a little clips up there. Give us a little candid feedback of what you think would work there as we learn. Producers at This Week in Startups.com. Always welcome to get some uh, feedback from you on what would be content you'd want there. We're going to start making content just for that format. I wanted to do that already, but we got, we got a little busy here uh, with so many shows to do. But we're going to start making dedicated. 90 second TikToks or, or you know, uh, shorts. Fun, 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 you know, fun, fun. Thing, I'm calling so. mine hope.earth. I'm just going to make like hopeful TikToks about climate solutions to make everybody feel better. Like, we got this. We can do this. All right. It may or may not be a long weekend. I'm just leaving it at that. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you Monday. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.